Hello, I'm Lenore Mounty from the Hoover Institution. Hoover Senior Fellow Eric Hanischek has just had a new book appear in print. His book, Schoolhouses, Courthouses, and State Houses, delves into the important topic of school funding. Today, his long-term colleague from Hoover's Correct Task Force on K-12 Education, Terry Moe, and he are discussing the contents of this exciting new book. So hello, Rick. Um, I hear you have a new book that's just come out. Uh, it's great to be here to talk to you about it. So um, I thought maybe we could start uh, um, by you sort of telling me uh, a little bit about the background of the book, how it came about. I'd be happy to. The, the book is called Schoolhouses, Courthouses, and State Houses. It's a book I've written with Al Linseth, who's a lawyer. Al and I actually met each other in the courtroom when we were involved jointly in some school finance cases. And in the uh, course of that work, we found out that people didn't know much about how schools were funded and what the implications were. And that's obviously much more important today with the state of the economy and many state budgets. So your book has an intriguing subtitle. Um, how did that come about? Oh, the subtitle is Solving the Funding Achievement Puzzle in America's Public Schools. And it comes about because we have managed as a nation to spend a lot of money and in ever increasing amounts of money in our schools and haven't received any apparent uh, rewards for that in terms of student achievement. We can actually trace uh, student achievement for 17-year-olds as they're about ready to leave high school since 1970, and we can do this in math, science, uh, and reading. It appears for a first approximation that uh, performance has been flat over that entire period. But at the same time, funding has not been. If we went back to 1960, which is roughly the period for these students, uh, spending per pupil has almost quadrupled in real terms. And it's happened in exactly the ways that people call for. It's happened by re reducing class sizes a lot, by having master's degrees for half of our teachers today, and by having more experienced teachers. All of these co cost money, but we just haven't got the rewards for that. So a lot of the discussion in your book has to do with the courts. So why is it that the courts uh, play such a prominent role? Well, it's natural that you ask that question. Most people don't understand how important courts have been in both the financing and politics of schools. Uh, this is actually something that we in California can identify with. In the early 1970s, there was a court case called Serrano versus Priest that had to do with the equity of funding across local school districts. These have actually morphed into a new version of court cases called adequacy cases, where the courts have actually been involved with uh, efforts to figure out how much should be spent on schools, not just who gets it. Well, to a political scientist, this sort of sounds like a breakdown in the separation of powers. Isn't the legislature supposed to be responsible for funding? Well. If you read constitutions, that's the case across all of the 50 states and the federal government. Um, but what's happened is I don't think these are constitutional cases. The governors and legislatures haven't done very well at ensuring that our kids are achieving more, and we have an educational crisis in this country. So many courts have just said, well, maybe we should get involved. It turns out that all but five uh, states have had some sort of school finance court case in the last 30 years. Well, so how well have the courts done? Well, this is the iron ironical part of it. Uh, the arguments in the courts are that uh, the governors and legislatures have not met their constitutional requirements of providing a good education for kids. But what the legislatures have actually done, as we talked about before, is ensuring that there's a lot of money for schools and increasing fundings. Uh, the courts, for their part of it all, have also been trying to figure out how to improve schools, but their answer has also been just to put more money into schools. If you look across the states, this hasn't worked. The states with lots of extra funding have not had improved performance. 
All right. So what you're saying is that the elected officials have done a bad job. The courts haven't done a very good job. So where does this leave us? Is there any hope? Well, we think there's hope, but it takes some fairly significant changes in the way we do things. Uh, in particular, we think that we just have to get the incentives right. By, by that I mean we have to focus on student achievement, which is what we care about, and reward success and not reward failure. Um, secondly, the major thesis of this book is that funding and educational policy have to be linked together because if we don't do that, we end up with a lot of perverse incentives in the uh, funding of schools. Well, more specifically, what do you have in mind when you talk about perverse incentives? Well, it's easy to illustrate uh, what we have in mind. Uh, almost all states, including California, have some policies that are designed to deal with failing schools, the schools that are on the bottom of achievement. What California does is that once a school is identified as failing, it puts a lot more resources into that school. But if the school gets better, the resources actually go away. So what this implies is that the state rewards failure but punishes success. Um, the second case where you can see this is uh, the way we fund teachers and pay salaries for teachers. We have the single salary schedule that only rewards uh, experience and graduate degrees by teachers. Unfortunately, the uh, research has suggested that these are not very important things in terms of achievement. We do not reward highly effective teachers, nor do we reward teachers in shortage areas like math and science, nor do we reward teachers who are willing to work in the most difficult schools with disadvantaged kids. So then how would you change things? Well, we're, uh, our, our answer is pretty simple. Uh, measure what you want to produce after you've defined what it is. Reward those who do it. Make sure that everybody, in fact, does, in fact, work to achieve uh, greater achievement. It's getting the incentives for achievement, focusing on achievement. That's really what counts. Well, it sounds like you're calling for some pretty major changes, though, in the final analysis. So what do you think the chances are that these can actually happen? Well, we're a little bit optimistic. Um, we are, of course, worried because in the past it hasn't been all that successful. But we're a little optimistic now because the American public really does support the idea of improving its schools. It's done it since Sputnik was launched. Uh, but combined with that, people in schools, the teachers and the teachers' unions, are also recognizing that the public is not very happy with their performance. And they are, I believe, looking for ways in which they can do, do a better job and get uh, better recognition for what they're doing. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Rick. This sounds like a really fascinating book, uh, one that clarifies uh, a complicated topic that's very important for public policy. I hope people read it. I hope public policymakers read it. Thanks very thanks. much.